on how activists, get out the vote organizers and other nonprofit profit and government workers can use open data, specifically this participation score created by the campaign finance board that we'll be talking a lot about in depth to inform voter outreach in New York City. So again, my name is Michael Perlis. I use he or they pronouns. I'm a project manager at Hester Street, which is an urban planning, design and community development nonprofit based in lower Manhattan. And when we do intros here, we are going to, for accessibility, describe ourselves so people who are vision impaired can have a little more access to us. So again, my name is Michael. I'm wearing a white shirt. I have slightly long brown hair and some a slight brown beard on my face, and I'm sort of dorky looking headphones. I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Devin Fields. Thanks, Mike. My name is Devin Fields. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a senior project associate at Hester Street for description. I am wearing glasses. I also have a beard kind of the same color um, and I have short black hair. I'm wearing a green shirt as well. And excited to be here today. I'm going to be talking a bit more later um, after um, Jamie gives her presentation uh, from the campaign finance board on kind of this map that we created and uh, the uh, how accessible that's going to be and how you can use this map for outreach and other sorts of learning about New York City through data and open accessibility. So I'm going to pass it over to Jamie. Thank you. So I'm Jamie Anno. I'm the data manager at the Campaign Finance Board. I use she, her pronouns. And for a video description, I am a white lady with dark hair with a gray streak in my hair. And I'm sitting in a office cubicle wearing. Okay, again, this is Michael speaking. So Hester Street, where I work, is part of the Go Vote NYC initiative, which is a nonpartisan initiative to strengthen democracy in New York City through civic engagement. And we do that by working with community orgs throughout the city to share resources and information, as well as lessons learned from these organizations' various get-out-the-vote effort and organizing. So part of this work involved, as Devin quickly mentioned, creating the GoVote NYC map and the data dashboard. The GoVote map has layers on it, which include things like demographic information, community assets, and other voter information, specifically this voter participation metric that the New York City Campaign Finance Board created. And so we'll talk about that shortly. So we really just hope everyone here in this session leaves today with more information on why and how the Campaign Finance Board put together this participation table, how we at Hester Street incorporated that data into our tools, as we'll talk about, and how Hester Street the Campaign Finance Board and other partner organizations, we call them go vote grantees, use these tools to perform outreach in their neighborhoods and to think about how participation data can keep supporting on the ground efforts to increase voter participation in future elections. So I'm going to pass it to Jamie. And Jamie, I'm not sure if you want to say anything specifically about the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Yeah, just really quickly, if you don't know about the Campaign Finance Board, we are a independent city agency. We mostly administer the public matching funds program that matches fundraising contributions to um, people running for city office. We also have a voter outreach wing called NYC Votes, and I am in the policy and research unit here where we do intergovernmental outreach, policy and legislative analysis, and we produce, oh, as you'll see here, on voting and campaign finance. So this is, whoop, okay, if you have seen our, uh, we put out a few community profiles, and so you may have seen this map. We released this in April 2020, and I believe most people were not paying attention to a 10-year longitudinal study about elections at that point. You may have missed what this is, but I'm going to explain the participation score here, shown here in the city of New York. So I'm going to... Uh, so the CFB's charter actually mandates that we analyze voter participation in New York City and the factors that lead to whether you vote or don't vote. So if you work in the election space, you know that the full election cycle is really over a four-year period. Um, so we go from presidential years to city elections to federal midterms to off-year elections. And each of those elections brings out basically a different electorate. Different people are voting in different elections based on 
the offices there. About 60% of registered voters come out for presidential generals, and then it tends to drop off for city elections, slightly increases for midterms, and then drops off a cliff for off-year elections. So in this project, we want to take a longer view about what people are doing in a full to a four-year election span and figure out what are the determinants that impact voting participation within that full election cycle. So this is really an example of what the voter file looks like in the voter history. So we put this together in order to determine how, whether you're eligible for an election based on the districts and the in the districts that you live in and in the political parties that you're a part of. And then this voter history file we received from the campaign finance board, or, sorry, the board of elections. And it's basically just a list of all of the elections you've ever voted in. So this is really the table that we put up on the open data platform. So we have a, we took out the county MSID, which is your voting ID. So in order to anonymize this table even further, we took that out and we replaced it with a random ID. We added an age and a registration year, but that's really the only personal information that's in this table. And you can see here, like political party 08, election district 08. So for each of those 10 years, 2008 to 2010, we have all of your political districts and your political party so that you can go back and see where somebody lived. And then at the end, in the second box, we have a the uh, election history. And so an NA means that you weren't eligible for an election. A zero means that you were eligible, but you didn't vote. And then a one means you did vote in that election. And so at the end, we put it all together. We calculate um, how many elections you were eligible in, and then how many you actually participated in. And that gives you a participation score out of 100. And as I said, that gives you a longer view about your election participation in the last 10 years. So I believe I covered all of this. There's 4.6 million voters. Oh, one thing that's really important to note is this is the only the active voters at the end of 2018. So this isn't something that you would use for calculating historical turnout. This is just a participation table of the people who are active. Oh, active meaning you're on the active voter rolls. You voted in the last, I believe, four to eight years. Uh, okay, hopefully that explains it. It's like a definition given to us from the Board of Elections. So there's active and inactive voters. These are really only active voters at the end of 2018. Okay. Again, you don't want to use this for historical turnout. Each year from 2008 to 2018, you'll see political districts and parties for each year. I believe I covered all of this. Yeah. And then I'm going to go over and then on waiting, if you saw that wait column at the very end of the table, I'm going to show you. So this is the first chart here on the left shows a frequency of eligible elections for full, for the full table for the full population in the table. So you can see it's like a U shape. It goes up at zero or one elections. And then most of it is around like 20 or 25 elections. But you can see on the right, um, if we look at the voters with a perfect 100 score, you can see that most of them have not had that many elections to vote in. And so to avoid giving undue credit to <laughs> uh, newer voters, who really only had one election to vote in. It's fairly easy to vote in one election versus the last 30 elections. We decided to weight these scores. And the way that we did this was the max number of elections somebody had was 32. So we used that as a baseline for constructing the weights. So a person with one eligible election was one out of 32. You can see here, this is my R code that I used to populate the weights column. And we did run this by a professor of government at Columbia University, Dr. Robert Y. Shapiro. And he thought that was a better idea than maybe eliminating some of the newer voters. Waiting based on the number of elections you have been eligible for is a better way to go. And I did note that the unweighted participation score is 29.2 and the weighted score is 28.3. So you can see the weights are like pulling back on the lower end of that eligibility scale. So hopefully I described what I've been doing <laughs> in this table. So now I'm going to go over very quickly how the Campaign Finance Board and NYC Votes uses this um, participation score. So please. 
So the first thing we did in our 2019 to 2020 voter analysis report, when we debuted this participation score, we used this in a linear regression with demographic variables at the census tract level. And so you can see we don't count inactive voters as they may have moved. And so they're in this hold holding period. And so they may not be voters in New York City anymore. And so we don't really count them. If you are an inactive voter, you're allowed to vote like in this other holding table, if that makes sense. Hopefully that answered your question. These are the polls that we found in the in our regression that interact with this participation score. And you can see more of that information in the in our 2020 voter analysis report. Because of the success in the participation scores, we decided to look at other ways to score people, basically. So we created a early voting score and a right choice voting score. That's from the cast vote record that um, was just published in the 2021 primary. We have how does the participation score influence early voting and ranked choice voting and what are the correlations there? So this participation score allows us to do more rigorous analyses on other kinds of voting. Um, it allows us to um, ties neighborhoods um, on score and other um, variables that impact the score. So we um, able to uh, paint more culturally competent and accessible voting education materials based on who live in those neighborhoods. Um, we are doing um, low turnout voters for outreach. People who um, want um, contact with candidates or parties um, tend to focus on doing outreach to people who are prime voters or triple prime voters who have voted in the most recent elections. Um, and groups like us and Hester Street are really the people who are to do outreach to uh, those uh, voters who may need um, uh, to vote. Uh, also seen this postcard um, then. So we um, grid um, lead history for the last four years for um, people who was in the 2020 primary. See this message here that a, um, about if you voted more than the average New Yorker or in the, um, so the average New Yorker. It was based on social pressure research kind of our dipping toe into seeing how um, your research really um, in New York City um, of, how, uh, of an incentive it is if you um, your voting history is uh, um, but is sort of like or on you. In the end, we um, find that this was actually very helpful, um, you know, research finding for us. Um, and then um thing that we do is we uh, give more over to um, community partners. Um, so when targeting um, women voters. Um, um, Hester Street asked to use our uh, table um, and I will let them um, explain exactly how they use this uh, participation score. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Getting a lot of um, support and thumbs up in the chat. We can move on to um, section. Um, uh, lead us off. So while I have this screen up of the Gobo NYC map that was described in Jamie's presentation, I just want to give a um, standing of like Hester Street plays, kind of like read everyone of how Hester Street plays a role in this. So we um, go on the Gobo uh, to basically be technical assistance providers. And so we wanted to help out uh, or just to help out nine organizations, um, organizations around the city on reaching out to their populations, trying to engage purposes, right? They can have a purpose of reaching out to black voters or voters who are not registered to get them to register to voters or, you know, uh, voters that are just inactive. Um, we be able to provide them with as much data as possible. Um, being said, this map is, there's a lot of layers on this map and there's a lot of data on this map and it's kind of many analysis. There's more like presentation of data. So then organizations can take this map and use it to their purpose, right? Make those analyses themselves. But we also provide um, tech assistance and one-on-one -on -one meetings with these organizations to talk about analyzing this data. We could help guide them to maybe learn uh, to help make kind of these conclusions that they can use to operationalize their outreach. Uh, said, this is the Google NYC map. Uh, do you mind dropping it down the bit.ly in the, in the show? Definitely. Just so everyone has it. Yeah, I'm going to go over it um, here, but you're also more than welcome to open up the map on your own time. This is, I want to say this is a completely public use map. Um, for there's no on the uh, public use data. Um, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, and be used by you as an individual, your organization, conduct not only voter outreach, but other forms of outreach in New York City. 
Um, so on the map, when you first open it, this is essentially what you see when you first open the map. It is um, from the left side um, the here, as well as some kind of like widgets at the bottom. And then your basic map navigation functions, right? A plus minus for zooming in and out, um, bar for searching. I, I will go over these widgets in a little bit, but a legend tab, a layer tab, which is currently open, a bookmark tab, a print tab, a share tab, um, tab, and an about. Um, I think I want to go in the order of what I would say I recommend um, you this map for the first time to go in. So before maybe zooming in and out on the map, I would open up the about tab here. Um, you know, these like little tabs that pop up are kind of movable or resizable. So you can kind of like customize the map in your own uh, visual. Um, you can learn more about the project with this link, but the main thing about it, the about tab is a how to guide. Um, learn a little bit more about um, it, where we got this data from. And it's also just kind of like out like a step one through like 10, how to use this map in depth, which I will go through now. Um, a uh, really great resource. So before you even jump into the data, I definitely recommend taking a look at this and understanding uh, and maybe you could find your sources on here. We try to, uh, we source every piece of data that is on this map. We want to make this as democratized as possible. Um, layer that you see on here is what Jamie went over, which is the participation data, um, or it is in this green gradient that you see going throughout, uh, and it's divided up by election district, um, you know, tiny little districts throughout the city. Um, and it has this gradient from light, dark green, um, here, the color, the lower the score, um, the color, the higher the score, and this is the weighted score, um, so about the unweighted versus weighted. So we want to be, we want to make sure that this score is the best reflection of participation data, um, of population. So it's very clear where there is lower to higher participation. Again, this is not turnout data. This is just participation data, but it is a really great first step tool for a lot of organizations to look at their neighborhood and understand where there's highs and lows, right? Where they need to be able to go out to high to more population to participate or to go out and to engage a population that's already participating very well uh, for that reason. It says it's an interactive map. You can click in on any part of the participation data and learn more about it. So if I click here in the middle of Park Slope, uh, there's an eligible voter population of about 878 people with a mean age voters of 46 and a participation score of about 43.6, which is fairly high, and around like an average for, uh, registration year of about 2004. Uh, if you went down to Sunset Park, where you see it's a lot lighter, where it's about 12.4. So there's like that very large range, you know, a neighborhood away in, in, in the borough of Brooklyn. So it's type of like nuance and data is really what we want the organizations that we work with to be able to play with um, at their outreach. Yeah, we have um, move off from the participation score data. I want to talk a tiny bit about um, organizations that have used it. We have um, using the we have organizations using this data and this map um, and low participation score in conjunction with uh, maybe their target groups. If that is like a race based target group, like say maybe black population or an API population, or maybe more of a foreign born population or um, in game like newer voters, like just eligible to be 18, you know, 10 year old voters, um, layers, and then start to zoom in on those areas, which is a really fun thing. And we get a lot of great feedback, uh, the map. As you can see, there's also a bunch of layers on top of the map, um, through the list. I want to go through what's here. Cause it's the first thing you see when you open up the map, um, the map that you see on the map, these like multicolored dots, um, shape, they're going to be, um, except from the endangered language Alliance, which is, uh, a great partner of ours at Hefted Street that um, had done some amazing research where they've surveyed um, local neighborhoods around the city to learn more about languages that are spoken and uh, within the culture there. So they use um, hubs that is private data, um, religious hubs or cultural centers are places that are hubs for a, a spoken language and that is then recorded in a survey. So it's a lot more nuanced than census data on languages throughout the city, which is really great because the census kind of like languages under certain of uh, language groups, but this is very, very nuanced data. So if I click one of them, for instance, which can kind of be hard to do sometimes in this mapping platform, um, but like St. Lucian Creole, which is a very specific form of, um, Creole under the Indo-European, uh, group, you get kind of like a kind of origin, a description, what well, speakers there are, this is like a really, really cool when it comes to language accessibility and voter outreach, right? We want to make sure that. If an organization lives or works in a certain neighborhood, they know the specific type of languages that are spoken in that neighborhood so they can make materials and they can reach out 
speaking that native language to make things a lot easier for the potential owners in that neighborhood. Um, and there's a couple things in the chat, Mike, is there any um, there that I could answer in the meantime? I keep going and maybe save these questions. I'm compiling them. So I was at the end, um, but I'm making sure that we're capturing everything to discuss. Awesome. I just want to make sure no questions get lost. Um, Big Diamonds, uh, the Gobo grantee partners. So just like a tiny bit of our, uh, this on public library, where it's located, if you're over here in Chinatown, um, but they didn't want to go. What happens where you click something on the map, but pick what you want to, you could just scroll over on these little arrow keys here. But as you can see, Gobo grantee has the treat. We're located at 113 Hester Street down in uh, Chinatown. Um, so with that being said, that's the layers that are currently on and they're indicated by the check boxes over here on the left. Um, these languages in New York City population areas is these dark gray outlines here um, as this participation data, which is this underlying layer. So I'm not going to go through all the layers because that's obviously something you can play with on your own time, but I'll go through kind of the group. So we have the first couple of set of focus areas. These are just um, census tracts that have a um, large majority of that population, right? So um, to turn on for sake, uh, least in focus area, we had a lot of organizations that were focused on engaging the black population to vote. Um, this is uh, in the about section, but I'm going to gauge my memory and say that this is over 50% or more of the population is black, um, areas like St. George and, uh, and as well as, um, Eastern. Brooklyn going towards Queens, uh, Canarsie, East New York, et cetera, areas where that focus group would be uh, densely populated versus others. And the cool thing about this is just like a um, layer, which is a really great way to use the comparison to the participation data. You can also look at different focus groups too, Latinx, AAPI, foreign born populations and youth. This is all from our conversations with the GOBO grantees. What were their needs? What were their focus areas? How can we help them out in that way? Um, we also have, uh, this is, you know, at the end of voting map, um, reach map. So we have voting sites. If you click that, just these little green markers that pop up, um, site PS321 and Park Slope, uh, details on where it's located, uh, handicap accessible entrance, what council district it's in, um, we knew to find voting sites in your neighborhood that you might be working in or an organization, you know, in, um, early voting sites, which are indicated by these red markers, same difference kind of details on if I can get to it. Our early voting site in the bottom of Park Slope location, as well as USPS drop boxes. We put this in here because of COVID-19, there was a, there's a huge surge in uh, voting, you know, like voting, being able to fill out yours and drop it into a box. And we wanted to make sure that people understood where their nearest USPS drop box was. This is directly from the USPS data. We also have COVID testing sites um, like of outreach purposes, people can be tabling to get people to go outside testing sites. We want to make sure that this was an operationalized, um, as well as a um, list of other facilities, right? Public schools, private schools, public libraries, child care services, uh, health clinics, mental health services. All of these are public data sets that we've collected either from the city or from partners of our um, community-based organizations. There is no finite list of CBOs in New York City, but we're trying to grow it every day. If you see CBO that is not on here, please feel free to email us um, to add it. But we have a pretty robust list here of our partners, as well as a partner of ours, United Way of New York City, um, uh, uh, the Immigration Coalition is also has a partner listed here as well. Redistricting layers on here. I'm going to turn off the participation data for the sake of making it a little bit clearer. Just clean this up a little bit. So we also have redistricting layers. These are proposals from uh, Republican Democrat. Uh, plans for the Senate, the Congressional, um, as well as the Assembly District. We had these here because there was a large conversation about redistricting prior to the latest um, um, ship that that was kind of successful for our um, organ. So there's a red dotted line for um, districts as well as a blue dotted line for Democratic District proposals. Talk about redistricting and how that affects population and why those lines are drawn in a very particular way. Make sure that both were accessible to be used for the analysis of the organizations that we work for. We also have different ways of cutting up data. Um, the population areas, um, uh, larger districts, community districts, city council districts, and some of the state government districts. Um, thing is, this uh, any of these data layers, you get a um, of data um, of this data that we have on the map. So total population, population is um, how much of the population is sixty five years or older. 
disabled, you know, internet access. We have a bunch of sets of data layers towards the bottom of this layer list, and all of this is aggregated by this. Um, so if I turn this off and I put on, say, city council districts, you will get a very different aggregate of data, right? Because it's, it's, it's hardest to collect that data within this bound, I will say, because we are here at a data conference that collected this data in a intersect way. So it's not, the margin of error is not large, but it does exist because it is taking a few census tracks, uh, not fully within the outline, but they cross over um, to figure out a way of, of calculating that in a more uh, direct with a smaller margin of error. So a great assault, but the data is fairly accurate. I've made sure to confirm it with um, this from the city and the, and the area is very small. You can cut it up. I'll keep city council districts on for the sake. Um, we also have subway lines on. This is just great for our, our district that we work with in terms of finding maybe local subway stations to get to populations or to recommend the population for voting purposes. Um, data, as we've talked about before, um, census data. These are all by census tract, starting from race to disparity. Hispanic origin all the way down this list. So if I throw this on a uh, great look at um, majority options by race. So it basically takes a color and it categorizes that color um, race. Sorry, it's like scrolling out uh, each chair. But uh, thing is, if you open up this little arrow here, it shows you the legend for this. So as you can see, this like purple here um, shows that it's predominantly at least in this area where this kind of blue is white and this yellow is Hispanic Latino and reddish color is more of the API population. So wherever you see that color more predominantly, that shows more predominancy of that race dense, uh, dense populated within that area. Um, of like the strength of performance is based on the uh, color. Darker purple means more black population in comparison to the rest. Lighter purple means a little bit less, but it's still predominant. Bunch of great factors. We This list of census data was, it was a kind of surveyed in a uh, one-on interview way with our Gobo grantees and wanting to know what they feel is the best parameters to look at, to learn more about their city so they can conduct better outreach. So we have things like race, uh, ethnic origin, foreign born population, uh, population, uh, teen or over 65 population, rent burden population, no internet access. It's a very, very low layer um, in general, but also due to the COVID pandemic of people taking in a lot more information over the internet. And if people lack internet access, finding out how to vote is a lot harder to, you know, better to reach. We couldn't do door to door uh, outreach because of COVID. So then we had to contact them via email or phone or social media. And if someone lacks internet access, email and social media is out of the question, right? So these are these type of layers that we really wanted to look at to understand more about the neighborhood. So RTs can do better outreach. If I turn that on, you can kind of see um, color, the more uh, higher the percentage of no internet access. So around where I currently am right now and uh, at the street office in Chinatown, there's a large population of no internet access uh, holds versus maybe if you look more towards like Park Slope near Prospect Park, there's a, maybe a lower level just in an aggregate way. Cool. Um, the other widgets that we have in the map right now, the layers list is up. Um, this can also be pulled up. It just kind of tells you the legend on screen at the map. Um, go to city council districts and no internet access. Have a print tool. This is really great for outreach because obviously you're not going to be able to have your laptop on you as you're hopping on the train to go meet up or, you know, to go. Bowl. So we want to make sure that you can print the map and use it offline. Uh, have a map only look, or if you do choose, choose any of these non map only uh, settings, it'll keep the UI on the uh, printer as well as you can put in any format, a PDF, a JPEG, an SVG, however you need it, um, and settings too, to have a little bit more of a tailored printout experience. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but it just provides a share link as well as an embed link. Um, it can be embedded on a website and it works great. I've, <laughs> I've embed we've embedded it on uh, it's already and you just adjust the um, width and height to make it um, your site. Um, the embed options are definitely there if you need it. You can also email it, Facebook it, tweet it, et cetera. Um, have I already explained? And then we also have the bookmark tab. This is a really, really cool function. And I have a few of them already set, but essentially what you can do is you can zoom in at a certain zoom extent of the map with certain layers on. Right now I have internet access on city council districts. I can add that bookmark. I can set this as like city council internet. And then that's saved, uh, like turn on a bunch of other layers and really just kind of do a different analysis on the map, click city council internet. It'll turn off 
anything that is not part of that bookmark that I said already and zoom right back in to um, typic zoom extent and that combination of layers. So that's a really good way to just like set your analysis, bookmark all the different areas and layers that you want, and you can just bounce back and forth. You don't need to worry about turning things on in different combinations. The select tool, this is really powerful because you can pull out data that you need based off of your selection. Um, sure, organizations have this because sometimes you're looking at a neighborhood, but not the whole neighborhood, right? Maybe you're looking at just a block radius or a uh, street in particular. We want to make sure that like you have that nuance as an organizer to look at data. Okay? So you can choose your selection by hitting the down arrow. Maybe I want to look at it. Um, uh, pun, um, select is selected. I can just kind of my polygon in a certain way, double click to complete, and then I'll select everything, um, the touch, right? So to kind of go out of, um, everything that was selected in there, if you just scroll down to the layer that you're looking at, maybe no internet access, it says 47 cents of tracks have been, um, you can click the three dot and you can export to a CSV file. And so this will give you all the data that was within this area when you selected it. And you can just put the clear to get rid of the selection. Uh, essentially them happen enough though. I know I gave a lot of explanation about this map and I really, really encourage everyone on this, uh, to open up this map and play with it yourself and share it and use it to how you would like to. This map is purely open, uh, and it, we really encourage more use of just voter outreach. It can be used for a lot of different things and, uh, we hope it does, you know, and you can always contact us to let us know, um, or if there's a problem with something or you want to add some data, we love to hear feedback about this map. We're very happy and proud about it. So I'll get that and I'll open up the room for some Q&A about the map, the data included and everything in between. Okay. Yeah. So to address some of the questions that have already been posted in the chat, many of them have been uh, to either in the chat or through further discussion in the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, first question, I believe Lillian asked was um, NGP van data is used. Um, I'm not sure if you want to speak to the, the Amy Either of you want to speak to the comments you made? Uh, Just go over this really quickly. So this is a really excellent question, Lillian. So thank you for asking this. And I think it really highlights the difference between how campaigns approach voter outreach and how government agencies, nonprofits, and uh, the, for example, go vote the Hester Street Go Vote grantees are approaching voter outreach. So. If you're a campaign, you want voters who are likely to vote in that election to vote for you. So you're conducting a persuasion campaign where you're trying to persuade individual voters who are likely to vote to vote you. However, if you're interested largely overall in voter turnout, like the campaign finance board is required um, for charter mandate and the go vote grantees are part that's a part of their mandate for why they were granted money um, is to get everybody to turn out to vote even people who don't always turn out to vote in the type of election that's happening that year so for example last year 2021 we had um, elections and we know that people are more likely to turn out in presidential elections and less likely to turn out in city elections. So using the participation score, we're allowed to kind of areas of the city where people turn out for every election that they're available to vote in, and then areas of the city where people turn out less often in um, election. And there's just a difference in how, basically a difference in our goals. And um, it's really cool that reason not to praise Jamie, who is my own colleague, <laughs> cool that the participation score was created because if you're looking at individual year by year voter turnout, it doesn't tell the whole story of who's turning out to vote in a neighborhood. Uh, participation score gives people that credit for turning out in elections over the course of 10 years time. Jamie, I don't know if you have other comments on that. I that I wish that uh, had data, um, something that the, he has done. Um, it was great out of our director in our public affairs department she hired me and said, figure out how to do this. And so I did. It was really just something in New York. Um, uh, I put it up on the open data portal. Uh, hopes that it encourages other people to put together similar participation scores or areas or um, use it our own voter outreach. Um, but I love to, ha to see uh, organizations, including the BOE, use this data, um, then put it together. 
And quickly, one more point. We don't have that type of data, uh, P band data on the GoBoat map because GoBoat is a nonpartisan initiative and that data, um, we, from what I understand, uh, to democratic and progressive campaigns. And so it was meant to be, um, and so that's why we don't have some of those data points. Um, question that Amanda had that has been also, uh, responded to in the chat was around, um, elected officials have been briefed on the information, um, specifically brought up, um, me, Ali mentioned that DOE, I believe is aware of that data. I don't know, Ali, if you have any more points there for Jamie. I'll let Jamie cover it. Okay. Do not use this, um, before, uh, encourage them to use it, um, to, uh, uni of their data that they have access to. Be diplomatic here, but, um, um, you uh, was actually about early voting sites. Um, and um, we don't really have a lot of information about how they determine early voting site or poll site uh, and, um, of, for them to use our data or um, um, data that they do use um, and be more transparent about um, how they're making those assignments. Yeah, I want to expand a bit on, um, on what we do have, obviously, early voting and um, both sites within this map. That is something that we've thought a lot about and we have discussed with a few of the GoVo grantees on accessibility to these sites, not only um, an accessible entrance, but more like getting getting to that site, right? There is definitely the there's definitely major inequities in um, it's in comparison to certain populations within the city. And it's, it's clear when you throw on one of the sets of players and a voting site simultaneously. And we encourage the organizations that we work with to make those assumptions and to utilize them to conduct even better outreach and to start to fill those gaps. But we also encourage anyone here on this call or beyond to make those assumptions as well as you and use that to uh, kind of want to be more voting sites in a particular area, um, really inequities in sort of the voting sites. It seems like it's full now, but when you start to zoom in at that neighborhood scale, there starts to be major roads and neighborhoods and uh, populations around nitrogen, uh, for instance, that lack voting site access. So that is very much um, on mind for us as well. Yeah, and then another question around um, this data specifically, I think the um, mission metric data to the um, Civic Engagement Commission. Actually, now that I'm reading this question, it's specifically asking about uh, the Engagement Commission's Language Access Committee. So maybe it's um, uh, um, the, the language layers and demographic layers we have in the Go Vote map. Um, I don't know if you're on, but if you wanted to elaborate on your question at all. Uh, well, I'm um, a member of the New York City Engagement Commission, specifically on the language access program. And we use the census data, but we're looking for more granular data. And it looks like you've got some really good data fields that might be helpful to us. So I was wondering if you're familiar with the work of the commission and specifically the language access project. And if not, I can put you in touch with um, the person heading that up. Um, yes. just, I can just cover this really mm -hmm. briefly because mm -hmm. um, we're the Campaign Finance Board works very closely with the Civic Engagement Commission, uh, which is related to voting. So they definitely have full access to the data that we have. Um, Joy, you're bringing up a great point, which is the data that um, government agencies are looking at to to assess um, in New York City is the current data about languages and what's really interesting i'm not going to speak for devin because i'm sure he'll explain this too but what's really cool about this languages of new york city layer uh, one of my favorite layers on the map is that it's also including historical um is so that you can get a sense of place um like not an, uh, i'm not an anthropologist but it provides you with like that historical context of how neighborhoods have changed over time um, different from what the cec is required to do which is determine where people live provide language access currently i'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on favorite layer <laughs> yeah yeah definitely also my favorite layer on the map um something that i was really happy to get from the endangered language alliance and it is the link that i have where it says like visit the link is a public link um it's an arcgis map as well as interactive as this just with this um so it's downloadable um you have encourage downloading and playing with it yourself but it just really provides that nuance of language is spoken or you to be spoken and why is that you know like we really want that nuance to be there um sure that voting is always accessible for everyone no matter uh language spoken so that's kind of like amazing about the map and just to note the colors represent a global region so a lot of areas of the world based off of like 
where they are in a uh, based on continent. So definitely uh, to connect. I know throughout Bradford uh, Street, that would be amazing. Okay, great. And it's, so is it, I understand the point that you're making, but is it safe to make the assumption that your historical data would still be valid? You know, you know the Creole population in, in Brooklyn for the last 50 years, can, is it safe to assume that there is still a large population of speakers in that ancient district? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I encourage visiting the link because I know the Endangered Language Alliance goes a little uh, further into their methodology on how they surveyed the population. I know they did on the ground surveying uh, cultural points. The data that they have um, has the destination to which they based it off of, um, and that point is based off of, but what is publicly accessible does not actually have the name of that location for protection purposes, and, and I'm happy about that fact. Um, it was recently, I would say probably within the last 10 years, surveyed over time, of, you know, groundwork that they had to do to get there. So you're right, you know, just one year can happen. COVID-19 hits, right, and a whole population of speakers might not be there anymore. So the data is very, very easily changeable. Um, being said, the historical basis is rooted in place, a uh, specific location that is kind of like a grow hub for these speakers or was one. So that's kind of where the data is based off of and the data is based off of. Okay. Thank you. I'll um, be in touch offline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Great. Thanks, Joy. A question from Roxanne was asking about updated district lines. Roxanne, I'm not sure if you want to expand on the question you asked in the chat at all. I know you said yeah. it was... Yeah, it was kind of... Well, thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. um, looks like we have proposal lines on the larger level. Uh, we have the approved Assembly Senate lines, which I don't think were updated. But I was wondering specifically about the EDs because you have the smaller parcels um, by district mm -hmm. have been updated. Uh, two very good points. Um, we did the redistricting lines with the actuals um, and that plan of ours. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, participation data, it's based on the election district, um, not the ones were uh, here, correct? Am I not mistaken? Yes. Yeah. So then I mean, that, it was the like two, literally was, weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two weeks so, ago. And yeah. that kind of, um, I mean, jumping in just uh, mm -hmm. if you elaborate in your answer, like how update that and how long will that take? Because I imagine it comes from the state. I'll leave that to Jamie to discuss on that part. Working with the uh, Department of City Planning to figure out how to update um, election districts. Uh, so I have an answer right now. Um, it, was literally updated like two weeks ago, um, be updating um, districts and this data. Um, to answer your question, this is based on, or was based on, on census tracts. Do you know if you have the updated, uh, just answered it, thank you very much. I do have a follow-up question if I could. Mm -hmm. I think this is for you, Devin. Um, Dan, that the VAN data might be partisan and this is a nonpartisan effort. Do you think that the participation scores, or maybe this is for Jamie too, um, useful to see through party lines? Participation does change uh, party lines. And then we have closed elections here. So I know that presents complexity because you couldn't measure independent participation. But that's actually a really great data point for um, engagement activists like me, where independents on Staten Island have a very high turnout. And I can't parse that in this map. Really, um, yeah, this map, a nonpartisan map, and I think that kind of, that did restrict us a little bit on, on, on the type of data that we, we chose to elude. Um, I think I want to let Jamie speak a little bit, uh, on that. Um, nonpartisan agency. So we didn't really delve into, um, party lines, um, as much. Um, but I can do that if you use the table, we do have, uh, that people are ready to, um, here, um, from 2018. Um, so uh, do that analysis itself, um, but we, um, kind of shut that uh, because of our non status. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Roxanne. It's a good question. And, um, you know, because of our data and obviously our city agencies are nonpartisan, um, these questions are really helpful as we think about um, ways to um, date app. So really appreciate your comments. Um, the next question from Jeff, he was asking about the no internet access layer um, and just wanted to know if there were any indicators or data layers around internet access via mobile phones. Um, mm -hmm. I don't personally know if that data exists, at least at the like, um, but Devin, maybe, or, or I don't, do any of you have thoughts on that? There or is, do you have any data sources? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, um, there is a data that I know the census collects on type of device in the home. Um, 
a ghost data, like internet to computer or um, have access to a phone that does exist. We didn't put it on the map. Um, we had the no internet access layer and we felt that that was nuanced and we didn't want to get that specific due to the fact that this is ACS 2019 data. Um, so we that that level above it made more sense to getting that nuance due to the fact that it might not be all that accurate because it is just a survey. But uh, what that is something that I definitely agree uh, is important, right? Uh, a lot of people are sending these type uh, the stuff through their phone, uh, the means of checking their email or looking at social media, even more so than they had maybe just a year ago. Um, so I, I question we'll be taking a look at that on my end. Um, I'm going to say I totally agree with Devin's point about how it would be interesting to see mobile phone access as well. But you can also think about these layers on the map as proxies for different um, elements of something like the demographics or sociological economic interactions that are happening in the city. So the no internet access is representing households. It's showing who has internet access in their house. And so there is sort of, I think, a little socioeconomic difference between someone who has internet in their home versus someone who only has internet on their phone. And being able to see that on this map, I think, is more useful for people who are doing on the ground focused targeting in their neighborhood because they're focusing on a specific neighborhood because certain people live there. And so this is actually showing more of a like impact based on a household level. Yeah. So they're doing a little bit of a different thing. But I do. I also think mobile phone access is interesting to see, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. OK, one more question from Hazel about um how ranking factors into this program. Jamie, do you want to um, speak the point you in the chat? Um, I'll try. Um, I don't really much, uh, a lot other than um, <laughs> uh, participation score to look at um, things like um, how we did with ranked choice voting. Um, and so we've an entire analysis on um, the cat was published by the BOE um, July one for the primary in June. Um, um, in our April report. Um, that's all. Um, stay Great, thanks. Um, Lillian, do you want to um, speak to the point dropped in the chat? Yeah, maybe I'll uh, just uh, re read the question. Uh, sure. yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, uh, uh, to double down from NTAs, I think that would be census blocks. Yes, that's theft. Um, we talked this a couple weeks ago about looking at census blocks. The problem is ACF data and census blocks, there's some of it and there's not all of it. So that track because we knew that census track had basically every single thing we needed and it was the most granular thing to the amount of data we can get that ratio was there with census blocks you start to lose a little bit of the data that is that we have on this map um how i agree that looking at that census block level does just give you that extra le level of granularity um and we are on our own end about how we can make that work with some particular data sets to really give that zoom in you know like about to look at um at a of like a whole block um that question and that is something that is on our mind okay great yeah so we have a little bit less than 20 minutes left so Devin, i'm wondering if you want to talk about the other tool we have the gobo data dashboard um and then as we'll have further questions um either the data set or about this new tool we're about to present on feel free to keep dropping them in the chat and i'll compile them and we can do one final quick q a at the end after Devin's yeah. presentation Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, we also have the Google New York City data dashboard. Uh, we built this um, as a response to the map. We had a feeling we wanted to make sure that the data that was in the map um, could be analyzed in a numerical way and kind of remove a bit of um, ge geography entirely, but take the aspect of looking at it in terms of a map in this top-down way and more and look at it more as an analysis of the numbers, right? Looking at um, in a different way. So we. Uh, we have a dashboard for that exact purpose. We built this with Tableau. So this is again, open source and uh, we'll provide the view. You can take a look at it on your own time. Um, participation score um, and some is up. I just wanted to refresh for some reason. Um, no. uh, the uh, dependent age rates, it's been of origin. All the kind of like census and participation uh, layers that we have on the map uh, show data visualization way. And then that can be filtered out based on geography. So uh, in, um, you know, so the first second working in Astoria, if you click that, um, uh, adjust it. It might not. Uh, that people want to do it today. There you go. Yeah. So say I'm looking at Council District 10, uh, it'll filter itself, and then it'll show you the data based on that. So as you can see, the rate and origin, um, 
pipe very clear change. Um, and now it's being indicated the area is about a larger Latinx uh, population of 83%. So um, it's a cool tool because we know that some people really just want to get the numbers out of the map and they're not particularly looking at like looking at where a facility is on a corner block. And they really just want like, what is the score based on this filter rule? Um, and so we wanted to make sure we gave that tool too to kind of separate it from the myself. Um, and you have to choose by location or you could just rank it um, from organizations on what is the highest or the lowest of something. What is the, you know, what's, what, what's the geography, you know, like what is the highest participation uh, rate? And that works a lot for organizations because they can, you know, maybe they can be like, oh, my top 10 highest ones, I can go there and I, I know that I can conduct great outreach there because people want to participate. They're open to listen versus the lowest. Um, and we want to score as well. And you can also do more than just participation score. You can do no internet access, as we discussed before. Um, code um, one has the highest uh, percent access. And uh, this is just like a great layer for kind of like uh, something more uh, numerical and also looking at rankings um, for, you know, uh, of like, what is the lowest in or no, what's the highest population of black population in the neighborhood? And that focus area map might be a little too um, on the line. So we want to make sure that you can just put it in numbers in a chart and get that out for yourself to, uh, for you and your team to use to conduct better outreach. Um, it's fully open and accessible. Um, we reckon look at it and play with it, uh, playing with it and let us know if there's any issues or there's some things you would like to see on this tool. We're always open to making changes to these things because we want it to be as democratized and usable uh, for all users of these tools. Yeah, with that being said, is there any other questions on the dashboard or the map, the data within the map, participation data as a whole? Feel free to either raise your hand or drop your question in the chat. We have a little less than 15 minutes. So any questions people have or comments or um, maybe they think could be helpful for us to add. Um, and I wanted to go back to the map for a second. So uh, for a little bit of, we had, we worked with some of the organizations um, for the Go Vote on outreach. And let me turn on the participation score for a second. I'll just lose it. Oh, down here. There you go. Um, participations on understanding um, things at really like a block by block level. So I think we were looking at um, which uh, area is Richmond Hill. I know I'm very, very close. I look at maps every day, so I'm, I'm learning the neighborhood really in a top down way, which um, definitely means that it's right. So, yeah, yeah, it's right. There. Um, yeah, so it's, um, and a very interesting thing about when we looked at this neighborhood is you can see that for you would think that for the most part, the participation data is just low all around, but there's kind of like the surge at the top left corner. Um, and then one of the like nuances of why this data is just so powerful at this level, because you can zoom in, you can see that there's this one corner of this neighborhood um, that had some much higher participation data than the rest of our participation score than the rest of. So if you click here, you can see that it's about 29, almost 30%, but then all of a sudden, you know, just down here, it's at 17 and that's a pretty large gap. Um, to look at like maybe not why it's that you can look at data and make a complete, you know, like it's because of X reason, but we wanted to kind of start to learn what that could possibly be, um, and to look at, you know, um, as a comparison layer, as you can see, it, it's a little higher where it was lower and also things like, um, population, um, it's actually, it's, it's actually a higher population of 65 plus in comparison to where there's also higher participation data. Um, again, correlation, not causation. We don't want to ever say that it's because of this is why it's high or low, but we want to make sure that that's kind of brought up to the organizations that say work in Richmond Hill so they can conduct better outreach and start to ask those questions. Well, why is that? Um, or in born population, um, but, um, origin and you can kind of make those with them. Oh, okay. I know the higher population, uh, the higher participation score also included a, uh, higher list Hispanic and Latino population where it was lower and it was more of an API population. Okay, well, that's really great because of that I should go in the lower areas and maybe bring materials that are in Mandarin or, you know, maybe some of the other languages that are supplied by the uh, languages in the UD layer. Um, the granular of the map is what we really want people to tap into. Um, and we are also to engaging with you as an organization, or as an individual, if you want to speak with us about getting to some of those like nuanced assumptions, um, we can try to get there. So I was just looking at the chat. I actually want to address 
um, are coming up, uh, we want to make sure, I want to, I think this is a perfect segue into the longevity of this map um, that we can discuss it. So we created this map uh, in response to the Boat NYC project, but that is not to say that it's not going to live longer than that. We want to make sure that this map is acceptable and updated. Um, as well, we're kind of forming what that update plan looks like in terms of uh, um, weapons, um, but obviously are uh, there's plenty of elections coming up, specifically the midterms coming up very soon. Um, and uh, the grant, we are still part of the project together or not, are going to need the help to find and operationalize outreach with these voter populations. And so we want to make sure that this is updated with information. Right now, the census data is still 2019 ACF data. The 2020 data isn't as nuanced, unfortunately. So that will probably say it's 2019 ACF data. Um, assumptions can still be made um, and we're trying to edit it and update it as much as possible based on that. But it will live longer than this and we will be making updates to the data when updates come through. Things like voting site uh, locations should be updated too, as well as uh, should we get the, uh, not the proposed, but the actual redistricting lines on. Oh, it's a great uh, recommendation from Ryan. I also just yep. want to add um, that um, the table um, is a table and we don't have plans on updating it for probably another 10 years. Um, so in 20, we may update it. Um, yeah, clear that um, we don't have media plans to update um, that data. Great. And then um, Faraj on the, the dashboard, he was asking um, how to go about extracting census demographic data. Um, the uh, geographic level, like with the different um, boundaries and borders um, Devin was discussing. Devin, do you want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a great, great question. So, um, in way that's done within the map itself, um, where we basically took um, the, say, a NTA uh, versus a center. Um, NTA is a bad one because they fit pretty well because NTAs were made with such tracks of mind. So let me use maybe like a council district where they cut right into each other and it's not a clean analysis. There is an intersection, um, so you weigh half of the census tract in one versus another. So with that being said, that census tract will then be included. I need to remember if it's within only one or both. I'm pretty positive we have it included in both. So in both, if, for instance, um, if I turned on, I want to make sure I can show my point instead of just explaining it. Um, so for the community districts or better yet, council districts probably better. There you go. Perfect. So as you can see, this census tract clearly is cut in half by county district 28 and 32. So the census tract will be equally represented in 28 and 32. So that's where that margin of error comes in. Um, I'm, I know I can set up some type of um, basically say, okay, well, it's about half the census tract so we can kind of remove that. But again, it is a census tract. So even that's not accurate, right? Because very different people can live on one side of the street compared to another. So that margin of error will always be there, but we, we've done have a pretty minimal margin of error and it just kind of cuts census tracks um, and includes them of uh, the geography, how it was done. It was basically taken an intersect of all the census tracks within that geography and then calculated the average or whatever the sum we needed. Um, but then it's also used in the geography right next to it if it's also within that geography. If that explains <laughs> uh, that. Totally. Uh, Devin, what technique did you use to be able to do those overlays? Between yeah. Can be um, we had, at have to use a combination of QGIS, ArcGIS, um, as well as ArcGIS. Um, I do it. Um, I did the uh, uh, match by feature layer function on the map itself. And then I did like a many uh, analysis, kind of like cut it down to sure that the many fit, right? So if it's in 32 and 28, then it was represented in 32 and 28. So that's essentially how I did it. And then I matched it to the shape file, created shape files, and then put it onto the map. Thank you. That's great. Okay, we have, I think we have time for this, this one last one that EM asked in the chat. Um, EM, I'm not sure expand a little bit on the question you asked. I think you're specifically asking maybe about the participation metric uh, data. Um, if you're there and on, on that question, um, I'm not to unmute, but EM asked, um, how would one uh, impact caused by redistricting is down the road? So can the current views or data be saved somehow? So in two, three, four, some amount of years in the future, we can do uh, it quickly. Yeah, um, I'll start. Uh, we think this was the conversation we had. We, we, we've talked to, you know, we've had some conversations with um, elected it's about redistricting on, on you know, again, this and so on both sides of the coin. And we, uh, we want to do it. Um, 
kind of look on the proposals of redistricting. Obviously, we need to put the new lines. Um, but to answer your question, we are thinking about how redistricting is going to change over time and change the, and not only change the neighborhoods, but also um, kind of like the bounce set. Um, that is, uh, this is a very, very big thing that we have been looking into. It might not be part of our uh, global project that we have, but I know that it's something that we at Test are looking into. But I'm curious to know if this question also might apply to maybe participation data. And if so, maybe Jamie wants to speak on that a little bit or. A little bit about it. Um, we feel like we're going to have a bit of an easier time because this participation score is based on census tracts. Um, and so my understanding um, of how to do historical analysis when you've redistricted is um, come the new sex to the old census tracts, right? neighborhood in 2020 um a census tract um um a tract equivalent to a 2010 census tract um ending of how to do a historical analysis where you sort of just taking that tract um into that uh brand new need um explain that very well um but this is a new thing for me as well so um learning curve here um, but uh, does that answer your question yeah yeah, I, I think that's helpful. You know, their comments also helps us, like I said earlier, to think about, you know, how we could potentially put in data, you know, maybe demographic data from the past um, and keep this live um, on so people can, in this example, see like potentially how certain demographics maybe over time are changing in the neighborhood. So it gives us a lot to think about. Mm. Um, more the hour. So yeah, um, it, it's been about the intersection. I also want to note that what I described is what we did for the dashboard. What we did for the map is uh, within ArcGIS, I wrote a custom expression, basically doing an intersection of um, the layer, but it does say the exact thing where it includes it in both. Just want to make sure I got that nuance because it was done in two different programs, but it's essentially the same way. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, we'll just want to um, thank Oz and the, the entire Matt, um Open data, the open data team. Um, I want to thank me and Ed from the campaign finance board, um, Devster Street, and all of the participants for for joining, for um, asking these awesome questions and giving us these suggestions and um, helping out how we can make this tool better. So really hope um, you all are able to use um, at some point in the. Day.